Pensado's Place is brought to you by Vintage King, The Blackbird Academy, Avid, Isotope, Recording Connection, Studio 202, The Slate Companies, and Audio Technica. It's the last of our NAMM shows, but our guests are two complete bad boys. One of them just off Beck's Album of the Year Grammy win, the other of Paramore fame. We've got a brand new ITL. News for you guys on the East Coast. The Pensado trade may be rolling through there around April 18th. <laughs> Keep that open. Yeah. Um, and this is a big milestone show for us. We'll tell you about that. You're at the place, baby. It's Pensado's place. Yeah. Thanks for hanging out with us today. So many things to share with you guys. It's ahead, episode number. No. Ah, go ahead. Uh, I can do it. Yeah, of course. Of course you can. No, you. you no, do you it. do it. You do it. Dos, number two hundred. Amazing. Beyond amazing. Amazing. Where did one ninety nine go? What do you think I, about that? Been, well, you know, I think two things. Good lord, that's a neat thing. And. How did they allow us to do 200? They should know. have bailed it like five or six. I think there are police outside that are going to stop us right after <laughs> this show. We may have reached our you limit. Know, thank you, guys. You know what? It's been a fun ride. Uh, uh, I have information that you don't have. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be even better. Just hang with us for a while. Shall we get going? Let's do it. Cool, cool, cool. Hey, folks. And, and happy birthday, by the way. Oh, you too, man. Uh, let's have a good hour. It's a birthday hour. Uh, we've got a double bang with two guests at the desk this week. Our licensed subscribers are getting near 110,000, simply amazing. As Dave just talked about, our 200th episode, um, we need to thank you just immensely and mm -hmm. personally for that. We couldn't have gotten here without you, and we have major intentions to take you through the next 200. Trust me when I tell you that. We're coming at you hard in 2015. We're excited about what we're going to bring to you. Who else got us there? Our incredible strategic partners. You know who they are. Vintage King, the incredible, incredible Blackbird Academy, Audio Technica, unbelievable, Avid there from the beginning, Studio 202, our partners in DC, our new bad boys from Boston, Isotope, and of course the Recording Connection. Your belief and perseverance in us is why we're here, right? Absolutely. And um, we want to keep earning that and doing our thing. Um, and to my boy here. What? What I do? Well, here's the cool part. <laughs> we had a couple close calls, but we've never missed an episode oh, in five years. Yeah, We're starting our fifth year. Couple close calls, like yeah. when I almost fainted. Yeah, that was, that was close. close. But I, I, I was ready to turn it into an ITL. You didn't <laughs> see the film crew, so you. <laughs> <laughs> Here is the sample sound when a large black man hits the ground. <laughs> That's gonna be that. Well, and we'll you had a couple sick, high temperature things, and you you made it through. Yeah, the worst one, worst one for me was I had a. Uh, Tooth, uh, a toothache that produced a high fever. Yeah, and uh, oh, that's I think I was more entertaining that day. Well, it's because Cole had punched you in the mouth earlier. <laughs> <laughs> that made it okay. But seriously, congratulations! Uh, uh, yeah. uh, how how cool is this ride? You know what the the show the show is simultaneously the most fun we have during the week and 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 a lot of work. You right. know, so right. so like like Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You might have heard me complaining a little bit, mm -hmm. but Tuesday, Wednesday, it's, it's like a good just, thing. yeah, 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 yeah exactly. it's, it's it's just it's it's wonderful. I I have learned more than anyone from our guests. Me too, me too, and, uh, and it's all because of you guys. Yeah. Um, we share that. Let me mention one other person or entity that has become very important in our lives, and that's Hal Leonard and John Cerullo, Bill Gibson, so so forth. Uh, a lot of stuff coming. So again, thank you. We'll turn this into a party somehow, some way, and get you involved. But you got us there, and we're going to bring some stuff back to you. Um, you heard me allude to announcements about April 18th, Washington, D.C. Probably will let you know next week. Plan your travel schedules. The circus is coming into town, and boy, we're bringing some surprises. Stay tuned for that. Also, we surprised somebody this morning with a happy birthday, and we want to <laughs> surprise him on air. So happy birthday to Frank Gwillen at the Naris office in L.A., uh, we jammed him up this morning. He didn't know. He's a big fan. He's yeah. got our book. And uh, uh, to our friends at Naris who support us as well, amazing. Yeah. Um, 
it's it's a happy birthday. It's happy 200. DP, why don't you introduce the ITL? Oh, uh, our ITL today, uh, we're going to run up to, to um, D.C. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, check out what you do. He's got a little studio up there that I really like and love what they're doing, so check this out. What's up everybody? We're going to hang out in D.C. with my friend Yudu. He owns uh, House Studios in D.C. They do a lot of amazing recordings there and uh, are somewhat known for their vocal production and vocal technique. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to uh, ring him up and uh, get some instructions from Jake and uh, Chandra. Yudu, how you doing my friend? Good, how you doing Dave? Man, I'm doing great. Uh, last time we talked, the weather was kind of ugly. How how you doing now? Everything moving moving pretty good? We cleared out all the snow and we're back to work. You staying pretty busy? I imagine so with with uh, with, uh, with everything you got going on there, huh? We are. We, we've learned to trick people into thinking that we, we know what we're doing. <laughs> well, the word on the street is, and you know I you know I live on the streets a lot, so you know I know that. But the word on the street is that you guys are doing some incredible stuff. Jake, my friend, is the engineer there. Jake, how you doing? Very good, Dave. Nice to meet you, man. I'm a big fan of Pensado's place. Um, I do recording connection stuff, and I teach a lot of students, and actually one of my students is here. But every student I have, I direct straight to Pensado's place, because when I was coming out of school, it's, believe it or not, dating me a couple of years back now, but I was listening to you guys when you guys were first getting started in the old studio with you and Herb. So, big influence on what I do. So, very nice to, you know, to actually sit down with you in the flesh. Well, thanks for that, Jake. I was talking to you to, a couple of days ago, and he had nothing but good things to say about you. So apparently, you uh, you learned a lot from watching Pensado's plays. Not really, not really. But... You can take all the credit. You can take all the credit. Jake, forgive me, but I forgot your last name. Uh, Gratiselli is my last name. Cool. And and Chandra, pleasure to meet you, my dear. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. They're treating you okay there. I mean, you getting you learning some stuff. I can't complain. Yes, it's been a good experience. What's your last name, Chandra? Lipford. Say that again? Lipford. Too cool, too cool. What's, uh, at this point in your career, um, what is it that you've learned at the house that surprises you the most from what you were taught in school? What, what, what What's the most different than what you thought it would be? So I guess this with this program, um, I didn't go to school for it, so this program is more like an apprenticeship. So you get a lot of real-time studying and real-time uh, experience. So I guess my surprise was I didn't realize as an engineer all that went into it. Like I had some sort of idea, but I didn't realize the recording aspect of it and mic placement and all of that and how that all ties into the the final sound. Oh, that's cool. Well, I mean, that's a sign that you're at a good facility, too. Um, in terms of what you've learned so far, um, did you realize as much care and as much expertise and skill went into uh, getting vocals to sound right? I did. I, going into it, I did think that some work went into mixing vocals and making them sound like how you hear them on the radio or um, on a CD. Um, and House does a good job of kind of showing you different ways to make the vocals come out the way you want them to. So it's been fun. Cool. Hey, Jake, have you got something you want to share with us in terms of uh, different things you, you do there at uh, House Studio DC? Well. Happy you should ask, Dave. Um, yeah, no, I definitely have some stuff pulled up. Um, so we do a lot of really cool programs. Um, we're known really well for a couple of things, but we've done a lot of the hip-hop records that you guys know and, you know, see on the radio, especially stuff from the DMV area. Um, and so when you're getting into hip-hop records, you know, especially contemporary stuff, as you know, you would know, Dave, um, you get into a lot of vocal correction, but not just that, but augmenting performances. Because you don't always have so much time with a vocalist, like, say, an industry R&B singer is only in town for a couple days or they're coming back from a show and you have to get what you have to get but sometimes you have to create those vocals so what I was gonna go through is I have some stuff set up and I want to kind of show you guys some cool waves tuning effects um, and different you know vocal and pitch shifting effects so that you know the listeners at home can see how to take the basic vocals or the vocals they have with one take and turn it into something like you hear from Imogen Heap or Rihanna or something like that so that's kind of what I was hoping to go through 
Chandra, are you ready? Oh yeah, always ready. <laughs> cool, so we have a song set up here. Um, this is from an artist named Brittany Sweely. Um, she's really cool. We do a thing called the Artist Grant Program where we pull artists from all over the country. Um, and we give them free recording time with different producers and different engineers. And so we only had a few days in the studio with her. So I'm gonna play you the hook and kind of show you a feel of what we already have and then what we wanted to go. So here's kind of the hook of the song as it was right now. Straight and throw us left away. You're savage. You're savage. You're savage. You're savage. So obviously a beautiful vocal, you know what I mean? Obviously she's an amazing performer and, and the demo is unbelievable. But you know, we wanted to give people a deeper view into what it could be. Um, so what I would do is I would take this vocal and I would create the harmonies that you hear in all the songs on the radio, create everything you need to hear. So I would take this main track, um, I would duplicate it. Let's do twice because we're going to build chords. We're going to get into some kind of cool music theory. Um, and often, you know, I'll take this main vocal and I'll just duplicate it over these two tracks, you know, to create the feel of multiple singers or multiple harmonies being made. Um, people use different auto-tunes and different pitch shifting software. I like Waves Tune a lot. Um, it's one of the ones that I use a lot. So I'll pull that one up right now. And what's cool with Waves Tune, I'll make two copies, like I said, because you'll see more later. But if we watch as the Waves Tune kind of goes, I'll pull it up on the screen. Waves Tune will write along with the vocal as it goes. So we'll play through the hook. The way you're savage. You're savage. You're savage. So again, as you know, it already sounds great, um, but the main key is C minor, right? So we want to add those background harmonies what we can. So if you even go to your guide on the waves tune, you can kind of hear. So we would be going up and let's try and grab. So. C would be our main note for the chord. You're savage. So while we hear that main chord play, as opposed to hearing just that, we would go up to the next note in the scale, which should be. You know, C, E, G would be your chord, as the guitar players know. So we'll kind of build off that E. And I'll take that main line and move it. So we'll get something like this. You're savage. And you get this feel, obviously, that we're going to go through the whole track, kind of an Imogen Heapy, Kanye West kind of thing. Yeah, oh, 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 play that again. That sounded good. It's Let me hear that cool, again. right? And we're going to go through the whole thing. I didn't hear any artifacts. Two of these, which is going to be crazy. But I'm going to play it one more time for you, too. So this is it with the tune, and then we'll watch it draw, and I'll draw it again. So I'm going to pull it up one more time. Yo, Savage! And so the same thing happens here, right? So I would make my harmony. Yeah, we're savage. But you notice that one didn't sound obviously as good because she bends her main note. So what we'll do is we'll actually make that note in for her. So if you look on Waves Tune, one of the reasons I love this so much is because you can physically see it as well as, you know, make it. So I'll make the note bend as you can watch her kind of waves move down and then back up. So you almost have this real creation of. Yeah, we're savage. And all of a sudden you have two different vocalists in, in a whole new world. Um, and obviously, you know, you've heard a ton of this stuff in every record you hear on the radio, but this is kind of a cool thing. And then so after that, let's even take it one step further. So we built our main harmonies. Cool. Main harmonies. All right. We're really nice. Let's add the third now. Like I said, we're guitar players, so we know our chords. So you know, C, E, the last chord's gonna be C, E, what? There you go. My man Dave obviously knows, you know? So I'll pull that out. Yo, savage. Yo, savage. So with adding that G, I get this beautiful chord now. Yo, savage. 
So from something where we had just one note and one chord and, and you know a demo cut, we now have something that sounds like it's fully vocally produced without having to have the artist in here for six hours and having to have her have perfect takes. So that's pretty so cool. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of something we do a lot. Um, I love Waves Tune. It's something I've worked with all the time. Um, this is a very you know basic way. I'll really get in and actually draw every single note and really get dive deep into my mixes. But you can see how something like this now in context of the whole song sounds really great. Your savage. Your savage. Your savage. Your savage. So at the end, you have something beautiful. Your savage. Your savage. Cool. And so it sounds effortless. It sounds, you know, Man. wonderful. It almost sounds like a Dave Pensato mix. You know what I mean? Something well, like that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. But man, thanks for sharing that with us, Chandra. What, what do you think about that? Pretty daggone remarkable. <laughs> like, uh, to not That's have cool. To have so, the in so here uh, I'm gonna check back in with you two in a few uh, a few months and uh, um, and with Jake there at the house studios. And I want to see you do that. Do you think you could show me that next time I get uh, get that way? If you ask me, I will definitely learn how to do it and make sure I can do it. <laughs> well, I'm slightly teasing, but I think you should learn how to do it anyway. I am planning on coming to D.C. real soon, so maybe I hope I can stop by and meet you guys in person. Yeah, we'd love for you to visit us. Absolutely. Hey, Jake, man, great job, my friend. Uh, that was really, really impressive. Um, I have just never thought to use that plug-in. I'm, I'm, I'm a big Waves fan, so I'm going to have to run, look that up and check it out. Yeah, no, you definitely should. Like I said, people use, obviously, you've taught many things, but Melodyne and Evo and everything in between, but Waves gives you an opportunity to really dive into the notes. This is why I like it, and, you know, really be creative as a vocal producer who doesn't have the time, you know? Yeah, we're blessed nowadays with so many, so many tools. You're entering into the profession, Chandra, at just the right time. Hey, guys, well, I'm going to sign off. Is, is you do somewhere around where I can thank him, or yeah, did he... Just slam me off to the side. Okay, you do. Hey, man... Great facility. Um, Jake's an all-star, man. What a great engineer. Thank you for sharing that with us. Chandra, um, I, I want to see you on the charts in a couple of years, my friend. And, and you do. I, maybe I'll see you soon. I, I, uh, as you know, we're probably going to head out that way soon. So. Hey, guys, over and out. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Great to meet you. Okay, bye-bye, guys. How are you? Great! We are back at our winter home. It's when we get to see all you guys. This is our fourth year, correct? 20. 24th year. Um, are you guys having a good time? It's day one. Yes, Herb. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for coming. Um, good crowd, man. A really good crowd. Um, look, this freaks out the NAM people. We met with them late last night, all the brass. We love it when the fire marshals show up, and it's like that's sold out to us. So. Fill up the hallway, jam shit up, cause a problem. That we we rock this booth every year because of you guys. So who brought rotten fruit to throw? Uh, my man, my I man. knew it. Great. Throw it to the white guy. Throw it at the white guy. Cool. I'm Canadian. I'm sort of I'm sort of latte, not quite black. 
Um, Te- technically, I'm latte. <laughs> technically, you're espresso. Okay, cool. Cool, thank you. All right, cool. Um, you're at the place. Pensado's place. Rocking. Absolutely rocking. I think you're the winners. All right, so that will be They're in these smaller, shows. They're smaller, and louder. And three, good looking. Three incredible shows t- brought to you by Avid. One of our earliest sponsors. People have us here every year. Treat us really well. Got some amazing things coming out, right? You want to tell them about Avid? Pro Tools 12? Oh, well, I'm already on 13. Oh, you're on 13? <laughs> Justin. Have you got, hey, Justin, you got Pro Tools 12 yet? Ken? Nah, 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 nah. I got Pro Tools 12 and you don't. So that's coming. And <laughs> uh, one of the things that Avid has thought about, which you'll see in our guest, are ways where Pro Tools 12 can serve as a collaborative platform yeah. for you guys to work together and do other things and bring the community together. So stay tuned for that. We got some gifts for you later, some prizes. We got some questions if you want to ask some questions. So without further ado, we got three rocking days. Our guest today, which we'll introduce in a minute, tomorrow at the same time will be Dave Mustaine from Megadeth, as well as Butch Vig. It's going to be absolutely rock heaven. And then on Saturday, we're going to bring out an old friend of ours, the dog, Randy Jackson, formerly of American Idol fame, will be here on Saturday and uh, share with you the reality of how creative Randy is, Randy's where all that the, comes Randy's from. One, we've known Randy forever. He's one of the best musicians I've ever met. I want you guys to see that side of him. Well, absolutely. And I knew him when he had $100. Now he's got about $30 million, and he has not changed one bit. He is the same regular dude, and he's managing chefs and all kinds of really interesting stuff. So come meet him. Ready to meet our guests? Yes. They are phenomenal. Um, They are friends of ours. They've been on the show before. Please put your hands together for Justin Meldall Johnson and Ken Andrews. Yay. Thanks, boys. How are you, bro? Good. Good to Day see MJ. you, man. Yeah. Oh, man. Ken, how you hey. been, man? I just how realized you? that you were that much taller than him. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, he's how does that make you feel? His hair is taller than me, though. Oh, that's true. <laughs> that's true. So here's the fun part for us. Um, after uh, we approach our 200th episode in about three weeks, and we start our fifth year, we've met a lot of people. We've gotten to know a lot of people, thanks to your graciousness. These two gentlemen have been on our show, and we had a great time. I, I actually think I threatened to stalk Justin at his studio by standing in the corner. I haven't done it yet. I haven't seen you there yet. Well, <laughs> I'm a good stalker. I've been there. I don't really you, invite you, stalkers in, you but just I think <laughs> you'd be an exception. <laughs> let, me, let me do quick bio stuff, and we move forward. Sure. Uh, because it, there's some parts where there, there's an intersection with these guys. Justin's been a bass player with Nine Inch Nails, uh, music director for Beck, Played and written with Garbage, Mars Volta, Dixie Chicks, Kid Rock, Pink, Drake, Macy Gray, and a whole host of others. Uh, He's produced, among others, Paramore, M83, Neon Trees, Tegan and Sarah. Um, And then the other interesting thing is he also co-produced and worked with Ken Andrews on his solo record. Now let's go to Ken, lead singer, guitar player, bassist, songwriter, uh, one, of, one of our directors who's back there, the one ginger guy that I see with his hand up, uh, is our... Put your hand up, Jonathan. So that's our director for our Pensado's Place. He directs for MTV and Discovery and Red Bull, but he is also a mixer first. And all he talked to me about earlier was failure, was the band failure. He uh, loves his ass some failure. So he's, he's excited. Failure reunited and toured a little bit last year. Mm-hmm. Um, Ken has produced a mix for the likes of Tenacious D, Candlebox, the aforementioned Beck and Nine Inch Nails. He's also been a solo artist. And then together, these guys have collaborated on Ken's solo record, creatively. Yeah. And also put together a band called Digital Noise Academy. That's right. Explain, explain the impetus for that concept. I'm curious about that. Um, I, think, I think it was just a need or, or a desire to collaborate with our friends and musicians, but everyone was in a band or, or you know, it, it, we needed like a, a little haven to, to just experiment. Sure. And, but everyone's busy doing their main things. And so it was kind of like a experimental uh, side project, really. Mm-hmm. Did you do it sort of 
band style where you got together and recorded in the studio? Did you do it digitally and send files and work it, together? The initial concept was that it was only going to be a collaboration based on uh, file sharing. Gotcha. Sort of like a more modern and larger version of um, Postal Service or something like that. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but it, we quickly realized that we needed um, the human touch and we needed to be together. Yeah. It's just for logistical reasons. We had some people in Italy, some in Toronto, some in San Francisco, whatever. So we had to do it all file, you know, with file sharing sure. and transfers and uploads and downloads. And um, one thing that becomes apparent to, to myself as well as Ken is how the ease of that um, seems to be growing. And, um, and now I keep hearing about things that are happening with Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. And it makes me very envious because when you have projects like that that could have really used that kind of help. Yeah. You know, There's that, that thing when you're in the studio together and you play something, no one really needs to say yeah. what they think. You can kind of just look at their face out of the corner of your eye and you know if you've got like the approval of your bandmates. Precisely. Um, so, yeah. You, you yeah. Where we hear that a lot. When we do things in Nashville in the country, in the country yeah. idiom, yeah. because the guys get together and play and it's so lockstep, they show up at nine, they go home at six, they take lunch breaks, everything is intuitive. They look at each other, they play, they know where to get out of each other's way, mm -hmm. and you don't have to say much. It's just an interactive thing, correct? Is, is that what you're talking about? There's just a, something about that connection. Yeah, there's some, being able to see faces. While you're while you're collaborating, yeah, is a is a is a difference. Yeah. Like we knocked out the balance of that record in one week when we were wow. in, in the studio. So, mm -hmm. you know, it just was inevitable that we had to get together and do it. And, and um, yeah, so that was that project. Cool. And then since then, the other thing that Ken and I have collaborated on it uh, is is the band M83. Yeah. Um, where Ken has mixed a couple of different iterations of of uh, songs for um, for films. Um, Serious, that's a whole other game, isn't it? Yeah, and a new record eventually that's that's starting to get underway that hopefully will also, you know, wow. him, yeah, we have wanna, him involved too. We so. want to dig into that. Hey, yeah. Justin, um, I, I want to ask you this question, and, and you too, Ken. Um, one of my favorite things about your work is the way you integrate the bass into the production and you find a way for it to sit there and to actually be somewhat of a hook. A lot of the productions I hear, with the exception of you two, of course, the bass sounds like an afterthought. It's, it's supposed to be there. All songs have bass, let me add a bass. What, when, you, when you're working on a bass part, what goes through your mind? Are you thinking the melody? Are you thinking rhythmic? Are you thinking make it fit? Are you thinking give it a... Well, for me, it's opportunity specific, but I will say that I'm always looking for a chance to do a secondary melody, honestly. Because that's, that's, that's one of your gifts, man, I'm telling you. You guys check out his work for, for how he places. We're going to talk about Ken and his guitar and vocals, but I love the way you do that. Thanks. I mean, I, that, that said, though, I confess that I'm a, I'm a little bit of a hypocrite because there's times like on that new, uh, well, the more recent Beck record, Morning Phase. Yeah. Um, <coughs> there's songs where I was very deliberately trying to create the biggest, most vacuous, empty spaces that I possibly could. So I tend to be a, a bit of a show-off mm. on recordings, but then there's opportunities for me to just savor the space and enjoy uh -huh. that. And have because the you're, because you're a bass player, do you approach it, and I'm asking you to speak for Ken, do you approach it different than Ken, who... who Let's face it, you're not, Ken, you're not as good as he is, Ken. I'm Ken, not as good as Ken. Ken's a great bass play player, bass, though. though. And the thing is about Ken is that he has um, a sophisticated knowledge of harmony and chords that he involves in bass that's a bit different than the way I do it. So he, he approaches bass from a guitar player and bass player and producer standpoint, as well as a mixer standpoint. So I don't know. How does it work for you? Um, I play bass like a guitar player. Yeah, I play exactly. a lot of chords. Yeah. And uh, very ham-fisted. I use a hu huge, thick pick, big strings. Um, I don't really have the touch or the melodic sensibility he that Justin the, has. He does have that. Um, so yeah, I, I I notice and appreciate what you've heard in in his uh, productions as well. 
we went over this a while back, but I, I, I'd love for them to kind of know this. Uh, if you don't remember, Ken mixed the latest Paramore record, and he mixed the hell out of it. It was he did an incredible job. It, would it be fair to say you did it in your garage? Yes. And he had to compete against some of my other friends, which we won't name, in a shootout, mm -hmm. a blind shootout, and he won. In an, in an encouraging way, can you explain to them how that felt when you did that? that Do you guys know what a shootout is? Everybody so knows what We that had is. five choices, okay? He, he should tell you, because he well, orchestrated it. You can segue, but the, basically yeah. the, the idea was... I didn't know that. The mixer choice was He's a hard the producer. one. That's right. Yeah, he produced the record. The thing is, is that um, it's pretty common these days for A&R people or upper strata executives or record companies to demand a mixed shootout when they have something where their the stakes are high and their ass is on the line and they're worried about their viability of a record or that kind of thing. So... To me, it's a little bit of a, like, it goes against my old school mentality to do this thing of, like, well, why are we, this is, really? We're having five different guys mix a, a, a song, and that's going to be the barometer that, but the, so Ken was my number one submission for that, and I had to sort of separate myself from the fact that he and I have a very long musical history together, and so I made it blind, and the way I made it blind is that I had my um, assistant engineer, um, code the files in a way when they were received by myself and the band and the A&R person that only he had the index of what was what. Mm. And he also um, did a little bit of level matching on the files so that mm. there was no, not with, not with limiting or compressing, but just like very subtle level matching so that they were at least in the ballpark. And they mostly were anyway, because most, most mixers these days are, are banging them out at pretty hot right. levels. So anyway, we did that. And there were... You know, it was like this, number five, number four, and number three, number two, and then number one. Ah! All right. And, he, yeah. and <laughs> my man. And we didn't know who it was, but everybody in the room, within 20 seconds, looked at each other and went like that. When you found out it was in, in the box mix, were you disappointed? No, I, I don't have any, I don't have, I have zero, personally. Uh -huh. Zero pre preconceptions Whatever or biases good. about console mixing or in the box mixing. I think that that's a very um, stylized, trendy argument mm -hmm. that doesn't really work for me. How about you, Ken? Do you have a preference so anyway. one way or the other? I, I've been in the box for about three years. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm fully. You're there now. I'm there. I'm committed. Got it. Um, and, and by the way, three out of those five mixes were also uh, were console mixes. Oh, so really? You know, ah. Two out of the five were in the box mixes. Ken. I believe number one and number three. So I don't know what that tells you, but yeah. it tells me that my biases shouldn't really come into play too much anymore. Right. <laughs> That's so. Ken, um, you know. it's impossible to answer this question, but on, on average, it takes me about 10 to 12 hours to do a mix. How long does it take you to do a mix? You're pretty quick. You, you, you kind of espouse the quicker's better philosophy. It, it really it depends on the song, how, how many tracks there are. We're talking about Oblivion, the M83 movie song. It was like over 100 tracks. It took two days. Two, it, probably a total of 18 hours, I would think. But a lot of orchestral material, by the way. Yeah, I had to mix ah, an entire so orchestra down. Like, like just an average, an average An average rock song, song. I usually have the nuts and bolts in about three or four hours. Yeah. And then I'm tweaking on vocals for another three hours. Um, yeah. Hmm. And, and Justin, how about you? Well, I'm, I'm, I make rough mixes that may or may not make the record. Mm -hmm. But I spend less than that only because I don't really have time budgeted for my mixing when I'm producing. So I usually try and like um, sneak in mix time mm -hmm. sort of surreptitiously off to the side or like when the, when, the, when the artist is left for the evening or whatever in the morning and I do my roughs and with me it's sort of a thing where I feel like kind of handicapped like I don't really want to be a great mixer because I rely on mixers mm -hmm. to be the other set of ears. I'm not well, really... Oh, no, I, I think in. I think everybody should be that way. Yeah, I, I just <laughs> my, my, mind you, some of my roughs come out good. They're huh? good. Yeah. Well, they're the map. 
Did, did his dress turn out that good? Yeah, yeah, they do. That's not what you said yesterday. Okay. Oh, man. He'll tell I, I made that up. Right I love a good rough. Ken, Ken is the nicest person on earth. He would never Ken Bus. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's him. <laughs> Let me ask you a quick question. So both of you are performers, really, uh -huh. on stage, as an artist, and kind of stuff. Does that sensibility, do you bring that to the studio? Can you separate them? Is it church and state? It, it's, it's in you. So it's it, in, I think it's in you. I think for me as a mixer, I rely on that background because I know what it's like to stand on a stage and hear a drum kit coming off the, a riser right. with no mics on it. There you it. go. Right. And, and, and a bunch of loud guitar amps. Right. I have a lot of sonic reference points mm -hmm. to kind of, so if I'm listening to a drum kit and I'm like, well, I guess everything's there, but it doesn't really sound like a kit, you know? So, exactly. so I'll work on a little longer till it sounds wow, that's interesting. like a whole performance. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing is that Ken and I are very fortunate because we have the rare privilege of being able to juggle both uh, careers, I guess. I mean, mm -hmm. last year, in separate circumstances, Ken and I spent half the time. I spent half the year on the road. Right, right. I was touring half the I year I didn't last do year. that much, but I, I, did, I did like 40 or 50 shows you know, last and, year. And ultimately, in my experience, and Dave's as well, perform it, performers, performing is part of your DNA. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not something where you just flip on the switch and flip it off. It is really part of who who you are creatively. It's not that, I'm not saying you can't manage it. It's hard to leave. But it is hard to leave, and so it's, it's got to inform your creativity, is my assumption. Oh, it's God, really, God, if you yeah. work for bands as a producer or engineer or mixer or whatever, yeah. it's, pr it's pr pretty helpful to get into their shoes every once in a while and kind of feel what their life is like, what the pressures yeah. are for them, you know. Mm -hmm. hmm. Just expand on that, because... I get the impression, having been so familiar with you, that exactly what he said, you take it up a notch. You're, you're, when you first meet the band, you're producing and by talking to them, oh, finding yeah. out what they no can. Question. You, can you expand on that? I just feel emotionally involved. If I'm going to sign up, well, I, I don't know. I just I'm the technical it. term for it is you bullshit with them a lot and yeah, try to course. find out who they are. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's a you know. Some people, historically, some producers in the past are legendary for doing it in a nefarious way. Mm. Like, you know, psychoanalyzing or, you know, uh, trying to separate the band members or being divisive or being brutal or, you know, telling them they can't sing and then all of a sudden, you know, they some, the singer somehow manifests some ability because they, they're doing it through their... Who was, Whatever. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not that way. I'm just more about trying to get it to well, be congenial. Mm -hmm. I, I want to say one more thing on the back of what he said about the live informing studio sort of trade-off thing. Yeah, I like that. The other that. thing that I'm trying to do is that I'm, I'm not just trying to be a song man in the studio. I'm also trying to think with, like, can this really and truly be a kick-ass live song for the band that I'm working with? Yeah. And not only That's will it cool. have the right peaks and valleys and be, like, really insane at a certain point or be dynamic or be intriguing for them to play, Will they not get bored of it? But also, and Ken thinks about this too, is it something that them as humans can render live without relying? Can they play it? Can they play it? Can yeah. they actually play it? I'm right. thinking yeah. about that stuff. Can I be all a, can I be a devil's time. advocate? Should should Ernest Hemingway worry about making a movie about his novel when he's writing it? Where are we going with I that? Don't <laughs> I'm over here with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Wait. Can I, I disagree with the concept. I think an album is an album, and live is live. I don't think they're. I don't think you have to but be restricted in making an album. I understand. Yeah. I understand. And sometimes, like, you, you agree with me, right, Ken? No. I understand <laughs> that. 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 No, not you the least. Have, you can not have your least. cake and eat it too, though. Can if it? they can play it yeah. and and it and it feels right as a live unit, and then you embellish it with all the stuff that they. Can, you know, won't have enough limbs to play live. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's cool. Right. But yeah. the nuts and bolts of the song, I think, has to come from them. They've got to have the foundation yeah. stuff there. Even on Tegan and Sarah, which was a pop record that I collaborated right. on. I did three songs for that record. Mm -hmm. That was very pop. So I used a lot of pop devices when yeah. I produced that. So, but still, yeah. I was always thinking, and we were talking about it as we were going. Like, they were asking me, yeah. like, okay, so maybe this part can, they, you know, so yeah. it's a consideration. Well, to be, to be, 
to be clear and honest, uh, I agree with you guys, but I do have an experience when I was a kid. There was a band in Atlanta called the Atlanta Rhythm Section, and they were the greatest studio musicians in Atlanta, and I didn't have any money, so I had to make a choice. Do I spend my money on a concert or the album? They were the same price. I went to the concert, and they sounded like the album, and I was so disappointed that I didn't hear some expanded songs. Yeah. Some, oh, some, yeah. You know, I, uh, and, and so that colored me in such a way that I always kind of was angry at them. And then I got to work with them as an engineer. I wasn't an engineer at that oh, time. Yeah. And, 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 of course, being constructed the way I was, I, I asked for my money back, but they wouldn't give it to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> wow. By the way, Ken is in, um, in my old room. That's right. Oh, I is that to right? Ask, yeah, I'm oh, in your old room. Look, yeah. oh. I, I saw some pictures. I, you look, it looks way better than when I was in there. It's a beautiful the way you got it laid out and all. I got the a lot of stuff everything. in there now. It feels <laughs> yeah. homey. It feels. I, I, I got to come by and check it out. You should. I'm just down the road now. Okay. Yeah, but great job. So, question for you: that one of the things in your history, when you worked on Nacho Libre, right? Yes. Ages ago. Uh -huh. Yeah. And how exciting a period that was. Tell us why it was exciting, and then talk about working on film and the and how that contextually is different than just producing a record. That's a, a in addition to producing a record, it, it requires other skill sets. Correct? Yeah, I mean you have to learn how to work with a director basically because mm -hmm. they're the the czar of everything, including yeah. the music. Yeah. So you have to get into their head pretty early on because you're basically there. You're there to please them. And they don't necessarily speak music speak. Or right, and they're not there all the time exactly. either. So you cut, and if, when you do get your face time with them, you really you need to figure out w where their head is at. Having said that, the Nacho Libre was, uh, uh, that was a Beck project. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, right. So he was hired to direct the music creation of that. Um, that must have been a ball. <laughs> He's so good in the studio. He will just, he's, he's like, to me, he's like a film director when he's in the studio. He gets all these incredible actors, sets them up in their little worlds with all their instruments, and walks around and talks to them. Really? While the song is being played. Really? They're all really? playing. We, he, while we're tracking, he will ap approach. Oh, I love and, that. And, and, and he'll say. Manipulate the, the idea or something. It's amazing. They might stop really? playing for a second to listen to him, or he'll hand them a different instrument. Yeah. And that's really? all that needs to be said. Well, I'd it's love amazing. to see like, that on video. Wow. Yeah, it's that's, very And that's cool. another reason why oftentimes we're at Ocean Way B or a big room like that is because he uses it. You bring in everything, and everything gets used. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool. cool. And that amazing. definitely was the case on Nacho and the albums since. You know? Wow, how brilliant is that? Um, I, I, want, I want to use this as a teaching moment if you guys would help me out. Uh, I'm, I'm a... I'm a big believer, in, in, and I love to collaborate. I love to talk with other musicians, other engineers. And when I, when I read about both of you guys, you know, finding, finding bands in the recycler and then having those relationships stick around forever, explain to the audience it's not a solo sport. It, it, you, you, you need relationships. Like, the interaction between you two is, is really instructive to watch because I get jealous. I miss those, that part of my musical life. Uh, the importance of, of going through this journey, you didn't plan on having these contacts b work out in a positive way financially. It, oh. It's just what musicians do, that collaboration you need. Can you articulate that bit? Well, let's start with you, Ken. Yeah, th I mean, I've actually made a record that was very solo. I mean, I, I had a little bit of input here and there. Uh, it was 2000 um, record, electronic record called On. Um, mm -hmm. I only made one of those. Um, it was, I, at that point in my life, it was an important thing for me to do. But I felt like when it was done, I, I kind of said to myself, like, that's probably the last time I'm going to do something totally alone like that. Um, yeah, there is something that happens when there's a magic, there's a creative tension, I think, that is 
helpful mm -hmm. a lot of times. You know, sometimes it's a it can be a little, you feel like it's stifling, like somebody else is stifling your creativity. Mm -hmm. But in the end, you f when you look back on it like a few months later, you can see how that brought you to a place that you could have never got to on your own. And, and you just... I've wrestled with that same thing because sometimes you feel that someone is um, taking the wind out of your sails or maybe appropriating an idea that you had or they're running with something and it's not cramping your style at all, but it's their time and they're running with something. But times when I felt like my creativity has been inhibited, it always pays off in the end. And I, as I get older, I'm starting to realize that those moments are actually really okay to live through and they're deeply educational because you learn to quiet yourself down and you learn to um, learn and modify your impulses to suit the emotions of a situation. And uh, it's not being manipulative, it's being um, civilized. Mm -hmm. Do you ever... Uh, I didn't mean to cut you off, Herm. No, no, talk. You ever, like, sometimes I'll be working on a mix, and it'll, it'll be 3, 4 in the morning, and I'm just completely lost, and I'll call one of my ex-assistants, and I'll say, can you listen to a couple of bars of this and get me straight? Um, I, don't, I, I don't think I could, I don't think I, I don't think I would want to be in an industry where I didn't have friends to just get opinions of, learn about new plugins, hang out with. But, but, but that's a moment for our audience, both at home and here. Um, sometimes when we, give comp when we speak, um, I talk about the head down society. All <laughs> of us are running around like this. As a matter of fact, here's a little tip. Um, they have now done studies where at the end of a year, you have put 60 pounds of pressure on your spine by having your head down looking at the thing, and they're starting to find out. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely true. And they're starting to find out that people are starting to have spinal problems from constantly <laughs> putting, their, you're just hanging your weight down. So, but the point I'm making prior to that is that sometimes you have to put your phone down and collaborate with people and get perspective and share and interact. You can't underestimate how important that is to your creativity. You can't get it all in here. You just cannot. You can get a lot. I'm not poo-pooing, but the, the way they hang and the way they talk about things, or when you call your assistants, or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be, or when we chat, or whatever, that adds to the tool. So just, just made, for all those folks who came up not during that time and came up in the digital age, you can advance your cause and get ahead of your peers by picking that up. It's a pretty simple thing, because a lot of guys are in here not doing it. Let me give you an example in our camp, and we'll get back to it. So Cole Nystrom, who is Dave's assistant. Cole. Who is, stand up, Cole. So that's Cole. Um, Cole. Cole is single-handedly decided to make sure that the ponytail, turn around, Cole. Yeah. The ponytail is going to live on one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> I call him the heavy metal drummer with jungle fever. That's a whole Whoa. other story. He's, a, he's an equal opportunity womanizer, but that's another story. Um, and then Changor Gantz, who's running around in the corner, Changor's from the Head Down Society. Now, he helps me out a lot. I can't move without him. Uh, Cole is about as removed from it whatsoever. And Cole is two years out of school and now teaches at Blackbird Academy. And I send him a lot of mixes that Dave doesn't do. Not that he's better or not. He just is absorbing information yeah. with his head up. And he's sitting down talking to people and sharing and learning. So, his so you're learning saying my assistant is better than your assistant? They do different things. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think this, is, this stuff's important. And I, I see an octagon match coming on. We, I don't know. <laughs> octagon. <laughs> <laughs> you will tap out. <laughs> no, I'm not going to be in it. Uh, oh, I thought it was me and you. No, Chango oh. and Cole. Go ahead, Justin. Chango. Cole and Chango. Man, I just think that um, as music creators, we go through cycles where we think we can be self-sufficient, and then there's other times when we realize that's a dead end. And um, a lot of it is technology-based. There's tools that are very, very... Um, there's just so many tools. Yeah. It's, it can be overwhelming. And I it's think. overwhelming, and then, and then people get the idea that they can make brilliant records top to bottom, but uh, sometimes they do, and well, I don't want to deny that. So sometimes there are records made in a solitary circumstance that turn out amazing, and we can name many, many, many of them. But um, usually they have a really good perspective 
somehow from themselves that they're able to apply. I don't have that. Right. I need it. I need Ken. Right. I need my collaborators. I need right. my assistant. Me I too. need. I have to have it. And and Me um, too. I don't. I'm not proud anymore. I just have to be able to use. I have to be able to delegate. And you know, sure, I can make like. If if um, there's something someone can, can do better and faster, I'd rather delegate it. Mm -hmm. That's all. And I, but not only that, I just want to. It's usually more fun if there's more people in the room. It, End of story. One hundred percent. I don't know. That's 100%. really the main thing for me. One of the things we've noticed. <clears throat> We're lucky with the show success that we have audio folks who come to us early and talk about different kind of applications and techniques and stuff. And one of the things that we see over and over, and even Avid is talking about today, is technologists and people in the space are trying to figure out how to make communities and bring communities together. They are noticing something that is important for you to already participate in. So if Avid 12, if, part, if Pro Tools 12 is part of what they're thinking about is how to collaborate, that has a lot to do with why it's important. So don't be behind that curve, get in front of it. Figure out who you're gonna participate with. Co-write, co-produce, figure out that kind of stuff. Put the, t put the tools down and talk. So just a teaching moment. Yeah. Ken, do you agree? Or do oh, you yeah. just say, you know, they're out of, sh they're, what the fuck are they doing? I come up empty all the time, you know? You, yeah. you, 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 you start down a path. Music musically. Yeah. Okay, course. cool. I just, 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 just wanted to be clear. You start. You you have a glimmer. You chase it down, and then you turn around four hours later, and right. you're just kind of like, mm -hmm. takes somebody take over. So somebody yeah. find out where I lost the trail. Yeah, what yeah. was good yeah. about that? What was good about this? Where was out, going? Like three hours ago. Yeah. And a lot of times they know because mm -hmm. they haven't been in there. They've kind of been more on the peripheral, mm -hmm. and they haven't gotten completely sucked in. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, speaking yep. of samples, uh, when and, and why would you guys use a sample on a drum kit? As the song evolves, you know, you're always tracking drums, usually, not always, in the front mm. of the process. Mm. So as the song changes, mm -hmm. the sound palette changes, the requirements change. So the kit you recorded on day one might not be the kit you need at day 10. That's all. End of story. So or I'm there not. was a problem. Sometimes there's a yeah. like technical problem, like the the pedal was bouncing off the head too much, or this it was squeaky, or just the mic fell down. I've had that like a lot of times. Like, people yeah, don't notice the, the mic fell off mic. the stand. It still sounds pretty close to when it was on the stand. Fire marshals. Hell yeah, love you, <laughs> love you, did it again. We are consistently sold out for four straight years. Love you guys, they're clear the aisles. Give them a round of applause, fire marshals. Yeah. Wow. Cool, cool. I hope your house doesn't get you on fire. Um, <laughs> I love you guys, you guys are the best. Quick question, so if you have, anybody have questions for us or the guests? We'll get microphones moving around, okay, cool. We'll get a microphone moving around. We also got a couple prizes to give away. Tell us, you're here today. What are you working on? Where are you going? What are you seeing? What excites you? Well, um, Ken and I got in our early on this, but the, the Avid S3 falls under the category of one of these tools mm -hmm. that doesn't actually get in the way of your process at all, and you are 100% excused from, for using it because it's just the most badass perfectly sized, perfect number of tracks control service. Nice. Surface that I've ever encountered, and I'm just so stoked. And um, we were early in on that. We're pretty happy about that thing. And not just because we're here in the booth, but that, that has really made my year so wow. far having that thing. Fabulous. But um, this seems to be the year of modular synthesis and synths in general. So Huge. Moog. Yeah. Their new modular system 55, all the other modular stuff in the analog game booth and downstairs, amazing. Dave Smith getting his sequential name back as a gift really? from Yamaha. Amazing. Wow. And now he's making the proper successor to the Prophet 5, the Prophet 6. Wow. Incredible. Wow. That's been pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Can yeah, you plus you, you're doing M83 where you can actually use all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I'm in the middle of making a failure record, a new one cool. right now. Jonathan Dean's new failure record. Cool, cool. Yeah, we're about <laughs> halfway done. Nice. Uh, just finished up uh, mixing a new Moby album. Oh, cool. And yeah. 
it, the, the beauty of what you have the, the ability to do is interact with these folks, ask questions. I mean, you're talking about cream of the crop guys who are here for you, here to share with you. It really is a... Yeah, uh, make us proud now. Remember, you're, you're, they're our guests. Uh, uh, absolutely. Your family, they're our guests. So Wait raise your hand if you have a question. Oh, were you going to say something? Raise your hand we're, if you have a question. Who is our microphone guy? Oh, there you go. All right, raise your hand high, and you, you have to ask quick. If you do a Shakespeare soliloquy, we'll have to take we, it away. Were we supposed to answer that question about our career stuff or no, about the main no. show stuff? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> All right, good. Okay, cool, cool. Fire away. Uh, hi, it's a question for Justin. Uh, you played on Sarah Bareilles' album, Kaleidoscope Heart. Yeah. I love that album. I was wondering uh, if you had experience working with Neil Avron prior to that, oh. or if not, how did you get that gig? Um, Neil heard about me, and I'm not exactly sure through whom. But that was a time, that was like 2009, I just finished the Nine Inch Nails tour, and um, I was back playing bass and doing sessions as I was transitioning more into like a full-time producer role. But um, I, he just got my name, but I didn't know anyone. The only one I knew is a drummer, Matt Chamberlain. So he and I had previous experience like making Tori Amos records and things like that together. But uh, Neil's great. Is he not a friend of the he, show? Yeah, yeah of course. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so Neil, for me, is in that category like Ken of producers who have good knowledge in every department of making a record. And Neil has that cool, calm, and collected demeanor that in the studio, just makes everything better all the time. So I really was blown away at the chance to work with him. And I have, a, I have a question. Yeah. In that you respect the cool, calm, collected, are you insinuating that you're not that way? I, no, I mean, I'm not. Ken, is he? I'm not. Is he cool, calm, collected? No, yeah. I'm more emotional. <laughs> he can, I love he that. can get a little emo. <laughs> yeah. so you and I are similar. I'm that way with us, yeah. too. Like, I like it. Stuff comes out when you no, do I'm that. Just, I just respond more emotionally. Absolutely. I, when there's a problem, I, ha I, I confess that, like, for me, I'm not necessarily always... I sometimes speak before I think. You know, I, mean, <laughs> I it's love a normal, it. I'm Listen, a I being. cry at undercover I'm not boss. A, I'm not good at being... So, uh, you know, it's, just, it's just pathetic. Questions? Anyway. Anybody else? There we go. Come on, Samantha. So talking about education, yes. there's this huge movement of for-profit schools uh -huh. that teach us all the things yeah. that you're giving to us for free. Yes. So as people who have been in it for years and learned it, I'm assuming just from doing it, where yeah. do you stand on that school of thought of paying for it or just doing it? Great question. You. I'll take it. Yeah. Um, back in the Renaissance times, the way you learned something was Michelangelo or would give you a call and he'd just say, look, you want to come paint sky for me at the Sistine Chapel for about two years? And so you're sitting there and you're painting <laughs> and, sky at the, and the fact that Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo could call you. Yeah. But in the process, <laughs> hey, you hey, see man, how somebody... <laughs> uh, in the process, you see how a great pers person works. Part of, of, of what I envy about these guys is they get to see other great people work and that's part of their learning experience. Uh, for me, it kind of sometimes it helps me. For sometimes I, I'm so impressionable, I spend too long on the things I learned and I didn't make them my own. But there's no right or wrong way. I, I envy people that went to schools because the right school with the right attitude can um, can shorten your your length of time you learn. Cole went to a school that's not necessarily known as 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 having produced a lot of great engineers, but he it turned out to be a great engineer because he went in with the enthusiasm and he came out good. Everybody's different. Everybody has a tolerance. And, the, and, and some of you guys aren't going to make it. But those of, our, those of you that are will make it, but you won't remember how you did it. It's just one day you wake up and people like your records and, and you say, well, that was easy, but it really wasn't. These guys starved. You know, we had bad teeth, everything. So it's different pathways. And, so, so, and <clears throat> can I add to that? Yes. <clears throat> if you watch the sizzle reel, we have uh, sizzle reels live in my head. Um, we have about, well, we did this about a year ago. We have about 120 some odd schools around the globe that use Pensado's Place as a teaching tool. Some as official curriculum, some give their students credit for watching. So it's a real honor for us. And, uh, and actually, 
five years ago was the first indicator that we were on to something. It was like six schools and 11 and 12, and I started paying attention to it going, wait a minute, this is gonna last longer than 90 days, let's figure it out. So what I would say is this. <clears throat> so we now have a very big footprint kind of in the education space. Um, they're gonna announce a deal tomorrow with our book publisher, which is the largest educational publisher in the world. So our curriculum series will be distributed in 65 countries, wow. 7,000 educational outlets, and depending on the stores, uh, our, our series can go into every Walmart, Target, Costco, Sam's Club, Barnes & Noble. Two points about that. You're sitting on enormous power, and two, is flabbergasting for us as a little web show to have that adoption. So to my point, oftentimes for-profit schools have a lot to do with business people who are making a business model. The teachers sometimes are pure, and they want to do the right thing. And you have to sort of be able to separate those two things. That said, you have a lot of tools available to you, whether it's smaller programs, whether it's online, whether it's us, whether it's stuff. What we are seeing is that people are now sensitive on the for-profit side, and they're moving toward teaching a broader-based curriculum and being more fair because they're getting sued and they're having problems, they're having issues. So measure, but separate the box so you can make a qualitative decision. Everybody's question? different, everybody's different. Anybody else with a question? Back to, go ahead. Yes, I got a question. Um, as far as you guys have been producing musicians, engineers, what do you think, or what would you say is key, essential to have, or to know in order to be able to balance those careers? to balance those careers. Um, math. <laughs> uh, schedule. Um, uh, yeah, I, for me, I, and then I think for Justin too, it's been kind of just like a, a, a bit of a randomness. You know, we get, we get, we're freelancers. We get, get hired to do something and we, we either do it or we don't. So, um, we're kind of always just chasing the next job in a sense, and where does that take us? Um, I would say, though, for, for me personally, I don't see how you could, I, I think some people have done it, but I, I don't see how you could um, have a thorough um, c career producing or mixing without s some knowledge of music and how to play an instrument. Just, just so you can converse with the musicians and kind of, you know, feel their situation, basically. Um, hmm. I think that for me, it's always been important to um, not be afraid to not make money. Hmm. So, in other words, to pull the switch. And for me, last year, I disappeared for seven months to go play with Beck again while my producing career was continuing to be somewhat on the rise, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for my manager, that's a challenging conversation <laughs> to have. <laughs> you want to do what? Ooh, I've been on the other side of that one. <laughs> yeah, I understand. You got to go where you got to go. I guess as I get older, and I don't have the luxury to, like, jump around. I mean, we all got to make a living. But I got to do what's, I got to, I got to have the most fun I can have. Absolutely. I don't know. I, that sounds a bit naive, but that's a simple, general way. I, I got to have fun, so I got to do them all. Ken does, too. I got to do it all. A corollary to that, we, we gave a keynote speech today, and one of the things that we talked about is get out of this if you don't have passion. Just yeah. don't do it. Like, if you're, known, if yeah. you're not inspired from in here, it, it's, not, it's not casting aspersions on who you are as a people. It's that in order for you to get where you want to go, one of the differentiators is that you care about it and that you're passionate about it and that it's in your pores and that you love it. And that's, that's one of the hallmark of the greats. Um, you know, we use guys like this who have become friends of ours. And I remember interviewing Justin. <clears throat> I was just so struck at how it was, it was part of, it was like the air he breathed was to perform. It was important. When we were in gear, when we did Nashville, John McBride, which is a, the Blackbird Academy, is a sponsor of ours, we're very close to him. They had Steve Jordan down to play drums and do part of his new drum plug-in line, which is coming out next week. And John did all the miking. 
John's in his <laughs> 60s, and he was sweating and doing it. He's got a whole staff of people, one of the finest studios in the world. Jo John did the miking. And you couldn't have kept him from and doing you, that. And, you, and, he, and then he moved the sound guy out of the way and did the sound. So I'm just telling you <laughs> that the greats like Dave and, other, and Justin and Ken, they still care like when they got in 20. In fact, they actually care more because now they have positions of responsibility yeah. and they have opportunity to roll. So please try to have that. By the way, Cole, I think... Anybody here need a Pro Tools upgrade? All right, so when this is over, see Cole? Okay. You got 13, Cole? <laughs> I got 14. Oh. Make sure you get with him, and we're going to sign up a, a, a couple of emails and make sure you get that. Somebody out here looks like they need some headphones from Ultimate Ears. I'm not sure. I'm not sure who it is. Cole, give somebody a pair of headphones. Now, that's amazing because there's some black women in the audience, and nice. Cole would ordinarily give it to them. That's amazing. Oh, dear. Cole, Cole, you've grown, my brother. Um, and if anybody cares, um, we have gotten our own theater. We are blown away at it. It's a, it's a, Congratulations, Thank boys. you, man. We have our own television studio now. Um, it's actually a historic theater where silent films became talkies right in the heart of Hollywood. Uh, I got to finish getting broadcast equipment into it, but we'll have a 40-seat theater. So if anybody would love to come to Hollywood and see a taping of Pensado's Place and be a guest... Cole has invitations over there. Do that afterwards. We'd love to have you. We'll probably start shooting those new shows top of February. Um, it's almost three minutes to go. Another question? No, you, can, you already have one, brother. Uh, we'll get you afterwards. Somebody else? Somebody else? Nobody cares. You okay. raising your hand. <laughs> cool. Uh, well, now you can ask another question. We'll give you another one. Uh, Ken, uh, while you were mixing during the process of mixing Paramoral album. Yes. Um, was your interaction more with good? Justin huh? you good? or with the band? Like, were are we you giving, finishing are we giving away and sending it to either one? I just did. Uh, or did you finish everything and then did. you got together with them? Or how was that process? Good. I was okay. sending to, uh, to all of them, right? I was you, the band. I think there was like oh. three or four people who were getting the mix. I, no, there was the band. Yeah. Me, Steve Robertson, the A&R. The A&R person. So the thing that was important is that we have to get our notes collectively yeah. as one set of notes for Ken yeah. when we listen to a mix and make notes on it. Uh, yes, I just want to add that because... I have, a, yeah. I have an, e an email that I send to potential clients that kind of outlines how I like things to go. It doesn't always get followed. <laughs> no. But, you know, it, it says, I like, a list of all the people involved in the decision-making process on the mm -hmm. mixes, um, I how I like the files delivered, and all that sort of stuff. So, can, and, yeah. and can, I sh can I share what we do, too? Because so it's, it's similar to that. When I got back involved with Dave and kind of looked at the process, one of the things, when so, so generally what happens in our process, emails come to me. And it's not that I suss the mu sort the music out or suss the music out. I get sort of an instinct on kind of what is Dave's thing. And then what we try to do and the reason we broadened what we mix for is um, I, I think you stay better if you're on edge and doing different kinds of music. So he just got done doing an indie artist, a fabulous independent artist named Peaches, which is not what you would think Dave would be known to do necessary. Then we'll do a Celtic music, and then we'll do a hip-hop thing, and then we'll do Michael Jackson. But one of the things I, want, I put in really early was a creative phone call. And in that creative phone call, the artist and producer, whoever counts, they get to talk personally with Dave. All the bars get set. Delivery, expectations, creative direction, file sharing. How many recalls? For instance, yeah. completely, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. what that may cost when it goes over. Exactly, when it goes over. Those, yeah. those kinds of things. Yep. When it makes sense to come in and spend time, how much time Dave needs alone before somebody comes in. Right. That gets so much stuff set, and it makes the end of the process much easier. Right? Does oh, that yeah. make sense? Huge. Uh -huh. Huge. So, you know, if you guys want to borrow that, the royalty rate on the Trawick system is not that high, <laughs> and you can send them directly to Pensado's place. Look, Avid stepped up when we were nothing along with Vintage King. Uh, they have stayed with us. They, they treat us marvelously. They make this, this is pretty expensive to do. Will you give Avid a round of applause? Avid! <laughs> Anthony Gordon, Cheryl, Sharon, there's so many of them. Claudia, really incredible. Um, the, uh, 
Cole will give you stuff that you need to have some fun with. Um, please thank two incredible, incredibly gifted artists. But more importantly, what you see here is that they are the same way as people. Don't lose who you are as you make this journey. Justin Melville Johnson and Ken Andrews, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Herb. Thank you. Thanks, Herb. Incredible. So if you want to take a snap or do whatever, come on up and we'll do that. Thank you guys and we'll see you tomorrow. Peace. Thank you.